Welcome to the Prison Professors Podcast. We serve people who face challenges with prosecution, sentencing, and prison. My co-founders are Sean Hopwood and Justin Paperni. My name is Michael Santos. We create digital content and our team offers individual consulting services. We also assist agencies that want to improve outcomes. To learn how we can help you, text the word Prison Pro to 44222. Again, text Prison Pro to 44222 and get our free brochure. You can also visit us at prisonprofessors.com or contact Justin at 818 424 2220. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Send confirmation that you reviewed our podcast and we'll send you a free digital book. Stay tuned for a 20 to 30 minute episode of Prison Professors. Welcome to Prison Professors. Today we have the privilege of listening and learning from Michael Whitehead. He is an individual who had some experience, about six years worth of experience in prison, but he didn't waste his time while he was in there, and now he is pursuing a path that may lead him on the trajectory of becoming a lawyer. Michael, welcome to Prison Professors. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your background and what brought you into the criminal justice system? Uh, good to meet with you, Michael. My uh Actually, I was arrested. Uh, there was uh, some events that occurred. In Tell us what they arrested you for. Uh, I was arrested for uh, a couple of theft charges here in Kentucky. Um, uh, theft of a legend drug, they call it. It's a well, it's the drug that I actually took. Um, and some theft of materials. And then also uh, practicing medicine without a license. And also reckless homicide. So when you get arrested for crimes like that, what types of, of, uh, of uh, activities follow? What, tell us what you did. You hired a lawyer. Walk us through that whole process of getting arrested for those serious charges. Uh, I, was, I was arrested after an indictment. So the, you know, typically the way it works is people are charged in, in a lower court and they're, they're waived to a grand jury. And that didn't occur in my case. Um, I was directly indicted. So uh, the police came and arrested me. Um, and that was actually the last time I saw my daughter. Uh, but I was arrested, went through, um, I was offered a plea bargain after about a month and a half. Um, initially, I was charged with uh, murder. Um, and after about a month and a half, a uh, plea bargain came through and it was for a, a, a lowered charge. And due to some technical factors, I, I denied that plea bargain, um, rejected it. And then uh, another plea bargain came and I, I pled guilty to that because it, it most accurately fit, uh, you know, what occurred. So. Well, hold, stop. how old were you? What year was it? And how old were you at the time? It was in 2009. Um, the event, uh, the charges came from happened in March, 2009. I was arrested at the end of September of 2009. And I was, uh, just, I was 25 and getting ready to turn 26 respectively. So with the first plea bargain that came your way, how much time did that offer? Yeah, they actually offered me 10 years, which so it was, it was less time. I actually pled guilty to charges, and that cumulative sentence was 12 years. But um, due to the, the, an issue relating to, uh, to my daughter in Indiana statutes, which Indiana is the, the state that, that had jurisdiction over her, uh, that's where we lived at the time. So um, I had my attorney check that, and I, I insisted on a lower uh, charge, but, but also – um, because it wouldn't foreclose on the ability to, to see my daughter again. Well, I'm sorry to hear about all of those challenges. I won't get into the details of your crime because I'm more interested in how you responded to that crime. Walk us through your mindset when you were brought into the criminal justice system facing those serious charges. I, you know, I was actually, uh, I was, I was petrified. I, you know, I, I'd been to that jail before. Um, as a, as a candidate, as a, uh, an applicant, uh, strangely enough about a year before that. Um, so to go from, from that side of it to the side that I was on, uh, was pretty strange, but, um, I wasn't doing the best. I wasn't doing good at all. I wasn't, uh, living the kind of life I should have been living after, uh, the, the charges related to the accidental death of my wife and, um, I didn't deal with that very well mentally after the fact, um, started drinking a whole lot and, and so doing a lot of other destructive behavior. So after that, that period when I was arrested, I was actually glad that I was arrested in some ways because I wasn't on a good, good course, um, was in jail and, and, you know, the prosecutor mentioned the death penalty (laughs) that, that 
I was 26 years old and had someone I didn't know talking about, you know, potentially executing me. So, um, to go from that to the plea bargain I actually received. Um, and, and again, I, it, it was fair because it, it reflected what actually occurred versus what was made out to be. Must have been very, very difficult for you and your family. And I'm sorry for that, for that change. What did you do while you were in prison to make amends or to adjust when you were facing those types of challenges? It, it was, it was difficult. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a few different kinds of people in prison, uh, you know, and, and, and Sean knows and other people know, um, you can either, you know, Kentucky has a good time credit scheme. So you can, you're given a sentence and you can reduce that sentence in ways. And I, I vowed from an early onset to, to try to reduce that sentence as quickly and as, and as often as possible. Um, so I was in a lot of, I was in five programs that granted, uh, educational good time. Um, they were education programs. They weren't faith-based. They weren't uh, cognitive based at all. They were, they were cognitive, but they weren't, they were, uh, actual productive classes, uh, Microsoft being one of them. Um, and also, uh, one that I really respect and like and, and, and adore, honestly, it's called uh, moral recognition therapy. It's a cognitive behavioral, uh, course that's peer reviewed and, and, and re- reduces recidivism. Um, I started getting into a lot of academics, um, Took some college when I was at the different facilities that I was at. Uh, uh, took some other courses that didn't grant good time, but they still were just information and things to have. Took a floor care, how to, how to buff a floor. I got a certificate for that. So um, I also went through a legal aid training, and the the, the timing of that was kind of serendipitous, I guess. Uh, the day that I graduated that, that training, um, I was presented with uh, adoption papers. Uh, that were, were being filed with my daughter. So I was able, because of that and some other good fortunes, I guess, I was able to contest that, but um, went through the process of, of a bunch of different classes uh, and tried to tried to get the time down, certainly, but also to, to, to make myself better when I came out. So, What was the sentence that your judge imposed? <laughs> uh, the plea bargain that he, he actually imposed was 12 years, so uh, 12 years. So it start, the first offer was for 10 years, which you rejected. Then when the government came back, they offered you 12 years, which you accepted, and you were able to work that down through your avoidance of disciplinary problems and participation in, participation in educational and vocational <laughs> programs. Is that accurate? That, that is absolutely accurate. Uh, I took uh, One of the courses I took was carpentry. And I also started masonry, but then I went to – I got moved and transferred for legal aid training. So I, I was very heavy into vocational educational programs, and that, that, that served a purpose. It, you know, If you're in class, you can't be doing stupid stuff. And there's a lot of stupid stuff that happens in penal facilities. So, While you were in there, Michael, did you have any disciplinary problems at all? Or were you able to avoid them because of your commitment to educational and vocational programs? I, I have to be honest. I, I did go to uh, uh, segregation, the whole, however you want to call it. Um, and that was for my, my love of tobacco. Um, so that's that, that, uh, that was a smudge. And then I had some minor, minor other ones, uh, no violence, no drugs, none of that. But, uh, one, I had a, had a magazine that I shouldn't have had. And the other report that I had was for being in an area, um, where a day before I was a legal aid, but I'd gotten fired and, but it hadn't gone through yet. So I was sitting at my desk doing some paperwork for someone and then I was written up for that. So minor stuff, but, uh, again, none of it was violent, none of it was drug related or, uh, anything serious, but just kind of piddly, you know, stuff. Well, there's no judgment on our part for that. We know how tough it is to live in prison, and we know that sometimes people get, you know, caught up in things that that result in disciplinary infractions. Were you what level of security level were you in? That was a, a big issue because when I was initially arrested, I was sent. Uh, Kentucky calls it controlled intake, so I was sent to a county jail because at that point in time, uh, a big riot here in Kentucky had just happened, uh, North Point. And so the state was was uh, pretty pretty discombobulated. Um, beds were backed up, and, and it took it was taking counties and jails and stuff more time to get people places. So the county I live in is the biggest county in the state, and it, so they they have contracts to send inmates before they're after the sentence before they're received by the Department of Correction to uh, go to other county jails to wait a bed in in state facilities. So that occurred. Um, I was there to another county jail for a few months, and then I went to the uh, the reception and housing institution here in Kentucky and 
everyone there is is uh, effectively maximum, but there's some. It's a dorm kind of environment, um, but it is pretty much kept in your dorm the whole the whole day. Um, I was my initial custody was a medium, so level three. Kentucky has five different levels of security. Um, medium is three. It's medium. So um, when I went to my first institution, it was in the western part of the state. And that stayed. I tried to appeal that um, for a lot of different reasons. You know, you, you're you're in custody. You want to have your your custody level brought down. And actually, the way it it works is that I had uh, they they assess points based on different factors, and it's just a receiving process. I was given three points, and if I would have been granted the custody level that that dictates, then I would have been out in the community. Um, but because of the severity of the crime, because a, a death did occur, that was there was an override placed on that. So. I was a minimum, but I was housed with medium at a medium level facility. I worked through appeals <laughs> with the state and classification branch in, in, in Frankfurt to reduce that. And I, I presented them with evidence and they, they agreed and overrode their own override. So I was pl- put down to a minimum level of facility and was offered the chance to go out and work in the community. But I deferred on that because of some different, different reasons. Uh, it wouldn't have been good. I don't think to, uh, to do that in the situation that it was in because of some things that were happening. But, um, I, I was, when I was released in 2015, I was down to a minimum. So it's very inspiring. I think for, for a lot of the people who are listening to this program, because they may be facing very serious charges like you are, and may be threatened with very serious penalties like you were. And yet when they hear somebody who was, who had a conviction like yours And a sentence like yours was able to work his way down into minimum security and then get out of prison may give them some hope. Uh, But what I am hoping they find is that there's a reason that it happened, and it was your commitment to focusing on education, vocation, and avoiding disciplinary problems. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about what your life has been like since you were released from prison? You know, I I still keep the... Kentucky, when they discharged me from prison on June 1st, I was given <clears throat> uh, a check for the state pay and the money that I had at the time on my account, which was maybe seven or eight dollars. Um, I was uh, I didn't have any clothes uh, and they don't let you leave prison in their clothes because they own them. And but they gave me a gray T-shirt and a gray pair of shorts. And I still have them hanging up. I haven't worn them since I was released, but I have them in there as a reminder. Um I, I, I try not to take for granted things. Um, my refrigerator. <laughs> I love my refrigerator. Uh, we've gone through two of them since we've been at this house, but uh, the ability to go and get food when you want it, make what you want, uh, that's something I've uh, never forgotten. Uh, I go out and spend money on stuff, food that I probably shouldn't because it's overpriced. But you know, eating that food that's in that environment for so long, uh, it, you so – um, I've been working pretty much since I've been out. There's been some gaps here and there, but pretty much continuously. Um, I've had a couple of real jobs, I guess I would say, as far as you know, W-2, where income reported, and you, they take taxes out. The job I've had for the longest, though, since I've been out is an independent contractor, and I do uh, traffic control for utility companies. Um, so that, that uh, it's a 1099 type job. So I get a, a form at the end of the year and have to pay taxes and file and all that. But, um, I have a, a house that I share with my girlfriend, um, and the dog and the cat and, um, lived here for almost two years. Um, it's, it's our house. Our landlord's, uh, excellent. He, I was honest and as close to him, my record and, and, and all that. And that was a big deterrent to a lot of people. They outright said, you qualify, your income's great. Your credit's okay enough, but we're going to refuse you because uh, of your criminal history. Um, so that, that was a big, uh, big issue. But I was, we were, you know, fortunate to find this place, and and it's uh, it's a, it's a good, safe environment. So, well, I'm glad to hear that you're able to rebound that way. What about what about your future, Michael? You you found our work by researching something. Could you tell us a little bit about why you were interested? in our work and, and how that's going to influence your life? Sure. I'm uh, in paralegal school right now, and it's not uh, it's not the, 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 the greatest of schools, but it's a school that I, I certainly enjoy, and it works with my work schedule. Um, but it's a paralegal school, so there's an emphasis. It's a bachelor's degree program. 
Um, and again, that's kind of started the interest in all of that. Uh, the the convictions kind of bar me from they definitely bar me from doing the job the work that I did before. Um, so I knew that I was going to have to kind of reeducate myself and and rearm myself to something different, another field. Um, it's kind of ironic, I guess, and strange that I found uh, the field of law, but um, I I went through a, a course, uh, a legal aid course, where I helped other inmates in prison to appeal their their convictions and also work on conditions of confinement. Um, grievances, administrative type things like that. And, um, you know, I try to keep, uh, keep current on certain things, um, that relate to that environment because, you know, the, the it's been my experience that the prison's kind of a black hole for a lot of things. And one of those being the constitution, unfortunately, um, it's one of the few places where you, it rules don't apply as you would think out in public. So it's because of the environment, but, um, I have an interest in, in law, and I, I like it a lot, and I've had some practical experience with it uh, on the receiving end and also on the, the, the contesting end. Um, but I was doing some research on uh, becoming an attorney um, through school, and it's one of the courses that we had. One of the assignments was to contact the uh, State Bar Association. Uh, we also had to interview a, a person who works in the kind of career field we want to work in. I did that. Um, so I called some schools and, and called some other entities in, in Kentucky. It's technically possible for me to be an attorney. Um, but it's a lot more difficult than other states, uh, say Washington and, and other states, but, um, it's something I do want to do. Um, I, I've seen the law work and I've seen, uh, how it, it's, and this is a bit idealistic, I guess, but it, it should be blind. It should be equal, uh, regardless of who is presenting the, the claim or the question. It shouldn't, this shouldn't matter who, is presenting the argument. If, if the law falls on their side, then it falls on their side. But that's not the way that it works all the time. So, so it was through that research that you fa- learned a little bit about us. Did you learn about my partner, Sean? I did actually. I, I heard about him before. Uh, the when I was released uh, from prison, I was sent to uh, a halfway house because the Department of Corrections made some mistakes, and then I was sent to the place that I actually applied to and wanted to go to. And the director of that place is wonderful, and we keep in contact, talk to her every so often still now, and I've been out of there for two years. Um, but she sent me some information on uh, on Sean and that he had overcome what he's overcame, and he's actually an attorney and a professor at Georgetown of all places. So, um, yes, that, that was uh, – I heard, I, heard, I heard his name before, but then – so because of that, I kind of kept uh, kept on the, the channel and stuff and, and subscribed at that point and then came across – uh, Tara, uh, her story and made some comments and that's how this all kind of got set up, I guess. Well, I'm glad that you, that you chose to reach out to us and I hope that other people who are listening to this program find some inspiration and hope in your story, just like they do in Sean and Tara's. What's really super cool is that you are not giving up, even though you said that you had to, well, first of all, even though you had to struggle through the loss of your wife and the the experience of many years in, in prison, you came back and said, you know, I'm going to rebound. I'm going to continue learning. I'm going to find a way to build a new life. What was the career that you said you couldn't go back to as a result of your felony conviction? For, for seven years, from 2002 until 2009, I was uh, a certified emergency medical technician. Um, so I worked on ambulances, uh, worked for a fire department, also worked for an industrial uh, entity that had, uh, had an EMS component to it, um, due to their operations. Um, so the, in Kentucky, a phony conviction bars that you can't, you can't, uh, even if you're in a phony diversion program. Um, but because of the events of what occurred, uh, I, I, I mentally couldn't do that. You know, anyway, even, even if I wasn't illegally or administratively barred from doing it, I couldn't do it. Uh, right. So you're in your early 30s right now. Where do you see yourself when you're in your early 40s? Well, hopefully in a better house. But uh, uh, I, I, you know, it, being an attorney, I think would 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 I would do well at it. I just I'm I'm uh, I have a hero, a couple of heroes. Uh, one of them is Charles Bukowski. Um, he was he was a genius, but he was lazy. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm a genius. I know I'm pretty smart, but uh, my procrastination kind of gets the best of me sometimes, but I always manage to uh, come through in a pinch, I guess, squeeze through. and. Who is and, Charles and well. Bukowski? Why is he your hero? Oh, wow. Uh, Charles Bukowski is, a, is, a, is an author. Uh, 
did, did a lot of other stuff. He had some movies that were made kind of based on him, but um, he's very uh, sarcastic and cynical. But one of his quotes, um, I'll paraphrase instead of quoting it, but uh, he says, my uh, ambition is handicapped by my laziness. So um, I'm trying to, to, to overcome that. Uh, I just, I, I know it takes a lot of commitment to, to go to law school with the record that I have, I'm kind of concerned about finding a law school that will accept me uh, around here anyway. Um, moving would be an option. I, I, I've considered that. It's not an option I'm, I'm not opposed to. But um, it's uh, – it, I'm not sure if I'd be able to do the most good, I guess, as a paralegal or as an attorney. So. Well, what's most important is that you find the way to build some peace and happiness and, and prosperity in your life for you and your family – you mentioned that you're not able to connect with your daughter or you haven't seen her since you went in. Can you tell us a little bit about what steps are being taken or how these collateral consequences are affecting you now? Sure. They, they affect me every day. I actually owe an attorney a, a good amount of money right now um, because of because of that. But um, I mentioned I was uh, served with adoption papers when I was in prison. And, and as part of that, I contested that asserted the, the the factual complaints and looked and started you know it, the, the analogy i guess is that i tried to fly a plane uh with no wings and, and an engine burnt out and tried to land it with no landing gear I, I i i knew enough about the law the structure of it but i didn't know how to apply uh what i was the facts of the situation to what was actually going on and put it on paper and get it in but um you know i i uh contested it and asked for an attorney uh during the whole process, and that was ignored by the court, and there's a record of that, and that's the Court of Appeals uh, referenced that in their opinion um, later on. But uh, I contested it. They granted the adoption illegally. Um, I filed a notice. I had the notice of appeal filed before I ever got the decision because I knew what they were going to do. Um, so four days after I received the decision, the Court of Appeals acknowledged the notice of appeal. Um, so I did a pro se appeal in the Indiana Court of Appeals of this adoption. Um, went through the process of that. They were they kept uh, denying my my briefs and motions based on um, very minor technical issues, things like page numbers. I didn't have page numbers. I sent a brief in, didn't have a, didn't have page numbers at the bottom of it, and that's a, a, a appellate rule that Indiana has. Um, so finally, uh, I got I got upset and I filed a uh, petition to transfer to to the Indiana Supreme Court because the Court of Appeals was overlooking the constitutional violation because of page numbers. So within a week of me sending that transfer brief in, the Court of Appeals reinstated my appeal brief and said I had 20 days to file it. Well, I did, I received notice of that because of the different, the different states that we were in. Um, I filed the appeal brief in 12 days, and I did it in 12 days. Uh, and that appeal brief resulted in a decision in October 2014 that the Court of Appeals reversed and remanded the uh, adoption decree, set it aside, vacated it, and issued a four publication opinion um, in that matter. So now that that case is is binding precedent in Indiana. Um, and the thing since then, I was released in 2015. So um, a couple things I did, I, I filed a complaint with the Judicial Conduct Commission in Indiana um, against the judge for doing what she did. I also filed a complaint against the attorney for the plaintiffs for allowing them to perjure themselves. And they did. Um, and I also filed a motion for costs. Uh, it really wasn't about the money to me. It was about letting the, the plaintiffs know that I wasn't going to give up and they woke up someone that shouldn't have been messed with. Um, do you have any, any prospects of being able to see your daughter again? The visitation is still, the, the hearings are still going on, the motions and all that stuff. Eventually, uh, I would say probably by this summer, a visitation hearing finally is going to occur, um, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. And, and appealing the decision, if it's if it's got some merit to it, isn't out of the question. But I like to think that, uh, especially with the, the things that I've done since I've been out, and also with the judge, um, and with the conduct of the other parties, that that's not going to they're not going to be necessary. But um, I believe I'll get visitation with her. It's just a matter of at what point. The important thing for our podcast listeners is that the decisions that you made while you were in custody had a direct relationship on you advancing your your release date and you're also putting you in the mindset that you can st could start building a record as you said since you've got out that may help influence the, a judicial system to bring visitation back to your daughter there's nothing we can do to undo the past but we can always start working 
to build a better future. And it sounds like something that you have been doing, Michael. Um, We've come to the end of this episode. Maybe you have some final words of wisdom to our listeners who are either going into the prison system or are in there right now. Uh, Perhaps you can give them some insight on steps they can take to begin positioning themselves for the best possible outcome as you have experienced. I had someone that I know that is deceased now uh, when I was in jail. And he told me, we were talking, he had he had kids, a lot of people in prison have kids, and, and prisoners are seem to be a class of people that they, they have collateral, you mentioned collateral consequences, you know, you get arrested, you lose your job, you, your financial strain, you have all these different consequences that occur, um, and you can lose your ability to have your vocation, to have your livelihood ever again because of that conviction, because of the choices you make. Um, but one of the things that we, we talked about, I'll never forget it, is... He said, don't do anything in here in jail or in prison that will make you lose a day of good time that you can't explain to your daughter or your kid later on. Uh, You know, so if you get into a fight and they take 15 days away from you, you're pushing the whole 15 days. Make sure you have really good reason to explain to them why you spent that 15 more days in prison. And if there's not a good reason, then don't do it. And it's not that simple, but. You know, some people become institutionalized and, and they, they keep going in and keep going out. Um, me, one time is all it took. I'm not going to go back. It's not because I'm not going to get caught doing anything wrong. It's because I don't do anything wrong anymore. That's good advice. That's good advice. And I hope that all our listeners will follow that advice. It's never too early and it's never too late to begin sowing seeds for a better outcome. And I want to thank Michael Whitehead for sharing his story about how he was able to overcome a conviction for murder and the potential of a death sentence to get back on his feet, begin focusing on education and vocational programs. And now he is out striving to become a lawyer like Sean Hopwood, Tara Simmons, and so many others. We wish you success, Michael Whitehead. And for those of you who are listening in the audience, we'll be back tomorrow with another inspiring guest. If you need more information on prison professors, please visit us at prisonprofessors.com or send a text to prison of prison pro to 44222. That's send the word prison pro to 44222. Thank you.